Today on the Midwives Cauldron podcast, we are so excited to be joined by Jane Hardwick Collins. This is an episode you really don't want to miss. Jane is an extraordinary woman. She describes herself as a menopausal grandmother. She was a theatre nurse, intensive care nurse, and a home birth midwife for 30 years. And now her work focuses on teaching the women's mysteries. She gives workshops on mother and daughter preparation for menstruation and the sacred and shamanic dimensions of pregnancy, birth, and menopause. In today's episode, we delve deep into the rites of passage and in particular, menopause. Don't disappear too soon if you think that you're not yet in this phase of your life. My goodness, were my eyes opened just with the amazing insights Jane has shared with us during this podcast. I highly recommend you stay tuned and enjoy the journey. I'm Katie James and this is the Midwives Cauldron Podcast. Each episode, I'm joined by my incredible co-host, Dr. Rachel Reed. Listen in as we hubble, bubble, toil and trouble our way through aspects of womanhood, midwifery, birth and lactation. So go on, subscribe now and hear us on your favorite podcast host. So Katie usually does the introductions, but I have I have wrestled this away from Katie because I really, really want to introduce you, Jane. Oh. So I am honoured to introduce Jane Hardwick Collins, who is my mentor and my teacher and my friend. Um, and Jane's teachings really put flesh on my PhD. That's how I kind of see it. And, you know, if anybody's probably heard me talk about Jane before, after I finished my PhD, I connected with Jane and did the Four Seasons journey and learned re- learned so much about myself as a woman and myself as a midwife and really transformed my practice and my understanding of rites of passage. So welcome, Jane. Oh, thank you so much, Rachel. <laughs> as I said, when you sat in the circle at the Four Seasons journey of the School of Shamanic Womancraft, what an honor to sit in circle with you. That's gorgeous and so lovely. And I can feel the love here as well, having known Rachel so long and, um, and how she's spoken about you, Jane, to me. And also knowing Rachel as she was almost transitioning through the course and changing her thinking and changing what was going on in her, in her world as well, or learning and broadening her thinking is probably a better mm. way to say. And then would talk to me and that that I think more changed my thinking and opened me up into this different space. So it's, uh, thank you for that as well, because <laughs> I'm starting this journey. I'm, I'm just leading into it. And, and it's through both of you, indirectly through you, Jane, and directly through Rachel, that's, that's pushed me further on this. Um, and I'd really like you for, there will be a, a huge amount of people who listen to the podcast, who know who you are and know your work and have heard you speak on many occasions and may have even done the four seasons journey, have your books. And, but there will also be people out there who don't know, um, about your work. And I'd love you to just tell us a little bit more about your work and your passions and maybe what led you on this path as well. Okay. Shall we start with that? That would be great. Okay. And like, I just want to add to Rachel's um, experience of doing the Four Seasons journey and how that put flesh on your PhD. The word I would use to describe that would be that you remembered all that because it was always in you as it is always in all of us. And so much of what this work, my work is our work and it's about remembering and then reclaiming. So so yes, well, um, to introduce myself, I introduce myself in different ways, depending on who I'm talking to, but I must say very clearly up front, I am not a registered midwife, but I am a midwife, once a midwife, always a midwife. So midwifery informs my every breath and is my passion and my honor to have been a midwife serving at the birth altar, as I would say, 
a priestess at the birth altar. And how I got into midwifery was because I wanted to have a baby and I wanted to learn all about it so that I wow. basically could figure out what would happen and how I could control it. But I didn't know that that was my motive at the time. That all came wow. out later when I lived the, lived the experience of the practical aspects of midwifery and having my own baby. So I did midwifery as a 25 year old in a big city hospital in Sydney, Australia. And actually I had an awakening, you know, like there's this spiritual awakening or a cultural awakening that happens to us at some point. And mine was right there in the middle, probably not even the middle, the beginning of my midwifery training. And the awakening I had was actually to the patriarchal culture. Like I knew that we lived in the patriarchal culture, but I didn't really know what that meant as a 25 year old. I mm -hmm. knew I was somehow less than being a woman. And that was um, something that I'd grown up with. I was the first born, I have three younger brothers. And um, one of the things I was always aware of was the disappointment my father felt that I was a girl. And so that's a common experience for so wow. many of us. Mm. And the patriarchal influence of being only a woman or being less than because we are a woman sounds, sounds intense and severe, but it's actually very true. So there I was as a student midwife. I was already a registered nurse. So I was just doing the one year program. I had this awakening where I, I awoke to the culture where I, I, I saw it because what I was witnessing at, in a state-of-the-art tertiary hospital, uh, I, what I was witnessing was institutionalized acts of abuse and violence on women and babies masquerading as safety. And that like cracked me open and woke me up and, the, and I got it. I got the oppression of women. I got the power over. I got the patriarchal medical system and you know did you get this from the beginning jane was this like an instant you walked into that system and that was already sort of within your being you felt that and saw it or did it take a while for you to it, realize yeah i think it might have taken a little while because you know i was a good girl i was a trained nurse i was follow um, the rules yeah yeah i might have grumbled a bit but I followed the rules because I knew what the consequences are. You know, being a bad girl is, yep. um, you know, a scary it's thing. It's not tolerated. No, not tolerated. In that environment. Exactly. Yeah. But I, I, at some point, and there were several incidences that uh, provoked the awakening, you know, the, the disregard of, to the women of the fact that I needed to do however many internal vaginal examinations I needed to do. And it didn't even matter who it was on or at what stage in labor she was in or whether she wanted me to do it or not. You know, it was that kind of thing. And so yeah. I did my midwifery in um, 1983 in the olden days. And um, this was actually an interesting time. It hasn't changed much, Jane. <laughs> no, but the interesting time because the um, medical um, awareness had not awoken at that time to the fact that babies could feel things. So we were still operating on the fact that babies had no pain sense. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I was one of those student midwives that had to hold down the little baby boy while he was being circumcised. And, you know, mm -hmm. watching how does he um, feel something? Look, no, he doesn't feel anything. Look, he's going <sighs> to sleep. Like, you know, clearly is in complete yeah. shock. So yeah. that was what I was seeing. Mm. And then, you know, that basically just awoke me to the culture, woke me up and um, so many more things made sense to me. And then, you know, when you start to be interested in something, lots of things come your way. And so that's what happened for me. And I started reading yeah. things and, and uh, other things. I nearly failed my midwifery exam because I was just, I just didn't want to answer the answers, answer the questions with the answers that I know they wanted, but you know, cause they were so wrong, but I only, I scraped through and then <laughs> headed for the hills, so to speak, and yeah. uh, began an apprenticeship with a midwife 
and started home birth. Uh, and wow. then that's where I went into the home birth world as a fresh graduate at 26 years old. And I did my apprenticeship for about a year. And then I started having my babies too. And then that was the next level for me where I actually applied the technology, so to speak, and um, learned that there was even more going on than I'd even imagined. Yep. Yep. I think especially when you've, you've, you start to experience it from the other side as well. So not just as the healthcare professional or the midwife and you actually go through, through the system. Um, and I think that happens with many things when you become the patient, so to speak, mm. your eyes are opened. Absolutely. Yeah. It sounds like a, 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 a similar story to many, many of us that have, have experienced the system, but it sounds like those awakenings for you were, were much quicker or maybe your body reacted to them much quicker or much quicker than mine. I think I towed the line for a lot longer. Mm. Um, and I think that's really powerful that you were able to say at such a, you know, early stage in that, in your career, I can't work in this system. I can't continue like this. I have to escape. I have to do it my mm. way. And maybe yeah. that's. I, it, I felt like I was doing it. I was part of it. I was, um, part of the system perpetuating the violence and I oh, couldn't, couldn't do it. I've got goosebumps actually going through me because it, and I feel quite emotional actually hearing you say that, which, um, just, I think because it makes me reflect back on some of the things that I will have witnessed and partake partaken in and, um, and how long I would have stuck that out. And I did it because I was the good girl and I was scared of being out of line and how that I would be vilified for that. Mm -hmm. And, and I wasn't strong enough at that point to stand up and make a stand. And yes, I changed my career path quite soon. So I was about 24, 25 and got out of that birthing world and then was able to go more into that sort of postnatal breastfeeding and then work autonomously and be able to give that care that I felt was a hundred percent. And every so often toyed with the idea of going back in, but there was this kind of innate fear of, I can't work as a, real in inverted commas midwife or as what I thought. And it's, yeah, I'm really feeling, I feel quite emotional actually mm. just hearing that. So thank you. Mm. A lot of my job is now as a lecturer in midwifery is kind of supporting students as they walk that exact same thing, you know, they go in there and they, they have this huge awakening. It's, it's so confronting and you forget when you're in there day in, day out that you know an experience that probably would just wash over a midwife who's who's used to it you know in inverted commas just smacks these students in the face and they're absolutely hor horrified by what they're seeing and yeah well i'm glad they so, are i'm glad well they're and horrified. i know and that's kind of what i say is i'd rather that you saw it than that you didn't see it yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Jane, as, as you are the queen of all rites of passage, okay? <laughs> but the reason I've invited you onto this podcast is because whenever I um, present pretty much on any topic, I try to just push in, put in a little bit of uh, the rites of passage mm -hmm. stuff. And afterwards, I always get midwives coming up to me and saying, I want to know more about that. You know, not about induction, not about the thing I've been asked to come and talk about, <laughs> but about the rites of passage, and in particular, the um, perimenopausal marga. Because most midwives, if we look statistically, most midwives are in that phase. And I think there's a lot of um, work to be done with margas. Now, that's not to be mixed up with Trump's, what does it make America great or whatever <laughs> yeah, the umpa yeah. says? Yeah. Um, yeah, let's stare away from that. that. <laughs> <laughs> we had it so though. Guess, actually, Jay, Jane, can you give us an overview of the rites of passage and actually the, and tell us where Marga fits into those yeah. rites of passage and phases of life? Yeah, for sure. So there's four seasons in our lives, just like there's four seasons on the earth. And 
we are all as if the earth going through our seasons of life. And so there's spring, summer, autumn and winter. And each of those seasons in our lives or phases in our lives begin and end with a rite of passage. So spring or maiden is the uh, beginning. And so at zero is our birth. Now, of course, our conception is the big bang that creates us. So if you can get the story of your conception, then there's some very, very juicy information as to how you came to be. But I don't know whether that's possible for very many people, but it would be very interesting. And for those, <laughs> yeah, for those who've had babies, like maybe one day you'll be asked, what's the conception, my conception story? So good idea to write it down while you remember. So, <laughs> so the spring, exactly. Oh dear. <laughs> Very funny. So spring maiden season starts with our birth and that's our um, emergence into the world and how we are born configures our life. It's not just some random event that you get over and hopefully forget. It is the beginning of everything. So how we're born impacts us and obviously our mother and our father and our siblings and whoever else is in the tightly knit little gang that is going to be imp impacted. But for the baby, birth stays with them forever and impacts how they, how we do process, how we are in the creative act, how we birth, metaphorically birth things. It doesn't mean that it's how we'll give birth to our babies, but it'll, we will take a pattern from our birth, a theme, to everything that we birth. So that's huge and such a big piece of information that helps so many people when they hear that and realize that because they know that, you know, like anybody who's creative and, and has blocks in any place of it, either the beginning, the middle, the end, or even before it starts, I, it'll be linked to how they were born. So that's the first right and you see i didn't be, i didn't believe that i didn't believe that jane i thought that was bullshit <laughs> and then <laughs> when i went and found out what the story of my birth was and suddenly realized that the theme had gone all the way through everything including how i birthed my babies how i do pretty much everything <laughs> that i realized it wasn't actually bullshit so thanks for that <laughs> and i'm just having those same thoughts going Oh my God. Like, I, I, I mean, I'm very rarely speechless, but I'm suddenly going, I, I, yes, th what, <laughs> what the hell's going on right now? I'm just having realizations. I'm not going to say much on this podcast, I think, because I'm just going <laughs> to these, these realizations of, oh my goodness, please, Jane, yeah. can you come over here and do the Four Seasons journey? I need to do it. Okay. I've been on some of the moon songs um, with some of your past participants and your leaders and um, I've really opened my eyes, but just, whew, yeah, okay, great. I'm going to have this amazing realization in the next hour. So this is fabulous. So Thank you. And, I'm quiet and, and look. And then, right. you, know, so you, so, sit, so you sit back, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You I'm sit like, back, Katie, and we'll move along the rites of passage. <laughs> <laughs> so our birth experience our experience of being born becomes our birth imprint which is what happens from zero to seven with the child everything that happens everything that their main people do their caregivers their mum their dad their teachers whoever are the main influences whatever they do about anything from zero to seven becomes the baby or the child's imprint on how you do something Mm -hmm. until they realize that and maybe update it or not. So, yes. so the, the big thing here as I move further into the rites of passage is to really know that a, your rite of passage is not a curse. It's an opportunity to figure out what the pattern is, what the theme is and use it, you know, like work with it. And we'll get into some exa um, examples in a minute. But the next big rite of passage after we're born Oh, hang on, just to say, there are all kinds of rites of passage. There are cultural rites of passage and there are physical rites of passage. So I'm going to focus on the physical ones, which in um, are referred to as the women's mysteries or the blood mysteries. So they are major physical transformations, times in yeah. our lives when we completely change from being one version of ourselves into another like a good example is being born like you know and you can't go back 
So once you're born, you're born. So then the next one is menarche. And mm. that's the first menstrual period, uh, initiation into womanhood. Now, obviously, a lot of stuff happens between being born and, and reaching 13 average age for menarche. And that has a huge impact on us. And we all experience wounds and trauma through our childhood that we then modify our lives around, which we then take that through our lives. And they, that shows up in our rites of passage as well, as do the stories from our red thread or mother line. So in our red thread, so the, there's a story. There's always some sort of story going on in everybody's mother line generational trauma basically and it isn't necessarily that we would do we would have the same experience as our mother or grandmother but there'll be a commonality and so one of the things that shows up in in rites of passage is the red thread story because whoever's going through the rite of passage passage is doing the current version of that red thread story and that's why things just keep repeating until somebody says uh oh no way this generational trauma, this repeating generational trauma stops with me because I'm going to do the inner work to unravel it, figure out what the cause is and update my belief system and move into a healed, healthy way. But that usually doesn't happen until childbirth. So menarche, average age 13, the initiation into womanhood. So what we know about rites of passage is that whatever happens or doesn't happen, whatever's said or not said, teaches the person going through the rite of passage on a subliminal level, which means they don't even realize they're being taught, how their culture values the next role they're going into and therefore how they have to behave to be accepted by the culture. So rites of passage create and reinforce culture on the inside through the mindset, the beliefs, attitudes and fears that the experience creates and on the outside reinforces culture because everybody goes along with what you're supposed to do to behave like a woman to be accepted in the culture. So Menarch, our first period is huge. Like it creates the woman that we are th then are for the rest of our lives. So the usual story around Menarch, well, hang on, let me just say something before we do that. A baby is hardwired to expect that when it's born, its mother or somebody replacing her will look after it. So, yeah, of course, at Menarch, a girl is hardwired to expect that somebody will teach her about the menstrual cycle. Somebody will tell her how it works and what to do and what not to do and how to help her and do this and blah, 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 blah. And it's absolutely frightening how little that happens. So usually the story, and I hope everybody's now trying to remember their story of their menarch, <laughs> because the work here is to recall the story. And you could, this could be an invitation to all the listeners for their homework. Recall the story of your menarch. Now, if you can't remember your menarch story, that's information because something must have overshadowed it. And so if you can't remember it, try and remember like, uh, like if you can remember a time when you were a teenager at high school and you had your period and then try and think, okay, well, that was that year. And what, what where was I the year before or whatever? Try and figure out what the actual year was that your blood might've started. And maybe your mother remembers too, or your father or whatever, somebody, but if that's still not available, then the idea is to try and figure out what year it was and then what else was going on, you know? Like, so for example, if a grandparent died or someone even, you know, like a, somebody, a death in the family happened around the time your blood started, then perhaps your mother was deep in the grief of that or whatever, such that your menarch didn't get any or much airtime or visibility or whatever. So the thing about that is, and this goes for any rite of passage, if there's something else really big that happens that has a 
like a dominant feeling or emotion, like say a death would have grief, then that tinges the whatever you've become. So just as a story, as an example, if your grandma died around the time your blood first started and your mother was deep in her grief and your menarch went under the radar, then your experience of being a woman is flavored by grief. And then that plays out in all the ways that it does. That would be the same for birth and childbirth and all of that. So at Menarch, we, we, it's, it, a veil descends on us and it's the veil of estrogen and estrogen, which is, you know, one I of hate the estrogen. You hate it. <laughs> well, mm. I can understand that. Because estrogen, estrogen is known as the hormone of accommodation. Oh, so, that makes sense then, Rachel, now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And so at 13, average age, younger, more these days for lots of reasons, which we, you know, some of them aren't very good. Yeah. So um, this veil of estrogen descends as the blood cycles begin. And what, how that affects us is that we really care about what others think about us. And also we... Oh God, I hate estrogen. Just <laughs> okay. I need to and, lose and some we, of this. Okay. And we, really, we really care that the people that we love, particularly our children or particularly our partners, our loved ones, or our careers, whatever it is we are completely invested in looking after, we sacrifice ourselves for, because we are fully under the influence of estrogen, which is the hormone of accommodation. But it doesn't feel bad. It's, it feels good. We are richly rewarded. You know, it's like, oh, unless, yeah. unless, unless you've had a childhood where you haven't had the chance to live the life of a wild free maiden and you've been traumatized or had to grow up really fast or whatever, then you carry that with you through everything and that impacts everything along the way. But wow. I'm talking about this veil because when I come to menopause, there's a story about this veil. But after Menarch, we have then got our years and years of practicing our power because at Menarch, there's a beautiful Native American saying, at Menarch, a girl meets her power. And then oh. through menstruation, she practices her power. So we spend wow. years practicing our power with our menstrual cycle, but actually that's not the dominant experience. Mostly girls go on the pill or um, any other kind of hormonal contraception, which just basically turns everything off and has us hanging in some limbo land. The pill switches off 150 mechanisms in your body, just by the way. So yeah. Yeah. if we could, if we did actually practice our power through the menstrual cycle, we would be living according to our cycle and we would be conducting the spiritual practice of menstruation, which is a big part of, of, of the work that I do. And it's actually what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to, we're supposed to honor the menstrual cycle, but we live in a culture that is a negative menstrual culture. And we live, we live with a pandemic. We have been living with a pandemic for a lot longer than this current one. And the pandemic we've been living with for thousands and thousands of years is the pandemic of menstrual shame, which comes from yes. menstrual taboo. The, the menstrual taboo, which has its origins with all the um, religions that are around the world. So yeah. um, back to menstruation where we're practicing our power. And then we, the next rites of passage are childbirth. But actually every pregnancy results in a birth and must be seen like that like it's not just a, oh well get over it try again it's yes every yes. thank you for saying that jane i mm. think that's really 
It's a really important thing to mention. Thank you. I think a lot of people will thank you for saying that. That's really powerful. It's so important. Like I, I'm going to say this word once and then I'm going to use a different word, like a miscarriage. So that's the last time I'm going to say that. And I'm going to refer to it as early pregnancy loss because mm. miscarriage implies there's something wrong with the mother. And that, mm. you, know, yes. you know, that's usually not the case. Mm. And language is just like, so powerful as we know as midwives and what goes on with the language you like you gosh know. absolutely yeah and every word is a spell so we have to really mm. choose our words with such um mindfulness so anyway early pregnancy losses and abortions an abortion is a birth it's yes. the end of the pregnancy and it needs to be honored as that you know because it's teaching yes. the mother Yes. everything so whatever she needs to learn because i i i know that we have the birth we need to have to teach us whatever it is we need to know next on our journey and that includes early pregnancy losses and abortions so every pregnancy is a birth and so part of those rites of passage and then the birth at 25 so we've gone birth first rite of passage, then menarche at 13 or so is the middle of the maiden season or spring season of our lives. And then we all move into the mother season of our lives, which is the summer of our lives at around 25 years old, regardless of whether we've had babies or not, because we shift. There's a very big difference between a, say, 23 year old and a 26 year old. You know, they're very different creatures that they're, they're what matter different things matter and so the zero to 25 in the healthy um, example the spring is all about me and it's the the seed that sprouts and then the budding and then the blossoming and then we move into the summer season at 25 and in that season we are the creatrix so we we conceive, gestate, and birth all manner of things besides human babies. And we, we need to nurture those too. And we, we have births there too. We think of a career, for example, you know, like if you really invest a lot of time and energy and into a career, then, then you need to, then there's a birth into the career and then you need Absolutely. to nurture that career, etc. So for women who never have human babies, they have plenty of other babies projects, um, yes. businesses, gardens, whatever. And the whole story of, of what I'm talking about impacts those births as well. And women who are having babies birth other things as well. And one of the key things in case we don't get back to it is that whatever we learn about ourselves in birthing the baby or the business or the career, whatever the process of birthing it teaches us, that's the quality we need to bring to mothering it. So think of that as a child too. So whatever you learn about yourself, birthing your baby, and, and I don't mean like, oh, I've got patience or, or I'm tough or strong or whatever. I mean like, what is the actual lesson that the birth teaches you? That's the quality you need to bring to mothering that baby. So, through the wow. summer season of our lives, we have however many births we have. And then the summer um, ends with the, the mother season of our life ends with menopause. And then, so average age is 50, 51. And then we go into the autumn of our lives, which is, has many names. And the one that I was taught by my teacher is Marga, M-A-G-A. And that name was chosen by the, the women in the community that my teacher was in, based on it being the female version of the male name used very often for that um, sort of autumn season. And that's Magus, which means magician. So Marga is just a female way of saying magician, a female magician. Other names people use uh, matriarch or grandmother or queen or um, enchantress or sovereign woman, uh, witch, um, priestess, all sorts. So it's, it's about, it's, 
it's not mother anymore. I mean, once you're a mother, you're always a mother, of course, but it's the next level because that's when that veil of estrogen begins to rise. Hooray! And from those her, from those names you have just said, for me, they all seem like they have another type of power, but it's a real strength power. If you say something like an enchantress or a priestess or the queen, um, ooh, this is like, oh yeah, this this doesn't for me. Having I'm not in that the stage wise yet, power. It's like yeah, this is exciting. This. This is not the perception that I think most of us are given of this time. This time seems to be um, seen as a, oh my God, I'm, I'm going to go through the menopause. Oh my God, my life is over. Ugh, what do I do now? But you're just those words make me feel like, yeah, this is, this is something to look forward to. This is, Wow. I'm going to feel this power, this strength. It's the next stage. It's a transition that I should look forward to. Yeah, absolutely. You've got, to, you've got to go through the birth of birthing yourself first, Kate, and you've got to go through perimenopause, which is a joy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of but course. But I'm sure Jane I'm, will get onto that. <laughs> I'm taking it on a, on, a, on a maybe a more mental level. I don't know than the physical, but um, yes, I'm sorry. I don't want to wipe out the... Um, the issues that of the perimenopause, which are, are a challenge to themselves. Yes, just, and you could you could just have an epidural and, and have get through that and come out the other side. Exactly. How long has that got to be lasting? About five years of an epidural. Oh, constant. maybe thirteen. Oh, right. Hmm. Uh, oh, so it could be maybe I'm definitely. not looking forward to it now. Yeah. No, no, no. Really, it's but it's a slow becoming. It's yes. it's a bit like puberty. You know how like. There is yes. a moment when we see the blood on our undies, but there's been a lot before that. Absolutely. You know, like the pubic hair, yes. the breast buds, the mm -hmm. curves, the smells, you know. I was like, going to say the smell. Yeah. Suddenly you're told to wear deodorant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, huh? What? Yeah. So the perimenopause, which peri means around, as we know, is, is a labour. And it's a labour that, is different for everybody and is as if a readout of their mindset, their beliefs and attitudes, their adrenal, the state of their adrenals, and also their fears, beliefs, their red thread, everything. So it's, it's a labor and the birth is the baby is the, wise woman version of us so it's like yeah. it's the mid midpoint of your life and it heralds the autumn which is the harvest season so this pro we go through a process an alchemical process a magical process to heal all the unhealed parts of us and awaken and awaken to and remember the power of the feminine because when we get to the other side it's not business as usual it's not like okay i'm 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 over that or i'm through that or i'm going through that but yes everything's just keeping on going as it is it's not that and all hell breaks loose if you try to maintain anything like what it was because this veil of accommodation lifts and and you know it's like how come I'm the only one who does anything around here? Or why do you keep telling me this? Or, you know, 40 to 60% of divorces happen around menopause initiated by women. It's like everything that you were putting up with before, this accommodation veil lifts and it's like, uh-uh, no more. I think I'm just starting to um, realise that I'm <laughs> going into that phase. I'm 41 and, um, and, there's been huge changes in my life, big moves, big changes, but it's a way of thinking that really in the last two years, and it's like this rebellion, this fighting back, this, do you know what? This is what I believe. This is what I'm going to stand up for. This is what I'm going to say. I'm not accommodating this anymore. There's still that hold back and there's still this massive amount of nurturing that's going on. But I was saying to Rachel earlier, I think that, um, 
I'm in a reverse cycle. I said, I feel like, you know, I'm in the mother phase technically of my life, but I feel like I've gone back to being maiden. I'm rebellious and I want to kick back. And, and then Rachel said to me, ah, wait till you speak to Jane. And I went, <laughs> because I'm thinking what, you know, I'm really, I sort of have reverted back to being a teenager at times. And I just think, no, I'm not doing this. I've got a stronger teenager who has this kind of self-belief and this gut to go, I will not stand for that. And these are my beliefs. Mm. And I feel this is right. And then I crawl back and go, oh God, I shouldn't have said that. And I worry about it. Mm. But it's like this strength that's, I, I love it. I love it when that side of me comes out. It's very, I think it's very similar to that kind of teenage rebellion, but it's very different in that, you know, my tolerance for fuckwits has never been very high, but it is just zero now. You know, I've got very <laughs> little how tolerance. She sticks up with me. <laughs> I'm kidding. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> in sm- in small bites. Um, so my tolerance is really, but it, and my, and I get really frustrated and angry, but it's more grounded and it's not as, it's not as kind of volatile. It can, I can respond more constructively than I think I did when I was a teenager. And I, this is a funny story because I actually thought I'd gone through menopause. I'm actually perimenopausal, but I thought, and this is just typical of my rites of passage. So, so I had like the, all the symptoms, you know, really hot flushes kind of all over, didn't have a period for, for about 90 odd days. And, you know, went through a few weeks of just feeling really all over the place and then it all settled. And I actually thought I've just done the menopause really efficiently and effectively. So now I am postmenopausal. I've done it. That wasn't too bad. And then, of course, bled again. So but... <laughs> damn. <laughs> I remember you telling me, Rachel, and you were like <laughs> trying to control it. <laughs> yeah, this one won't be controlled. Next level. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you know that I'm what working both, that out. Yeah. What you're both saying about that um, ability to speak up or and be more um, coherent, even, uh, is characteristic of of the role of the marga. And, it, you know, so Cedar, who taught me about it, said her, her quote is of, of the postmenopausal woman, she speaks the truth without blame or shame. Mm. So, you know, that's, that's, a, that's grown up. Yep. It is. And that's what we actually need in the maternity services is we need healed margas who are speaking up and changing things with their wisdom and their experience. We certainly do. We actually without need without blame or shame. And you know, like particularly in the maternity care services, like far out. I actually believe that margas or grandmothers, and I'm I'm not saying a grandma. I think I I would like to use the term grandmother to refer to a postmenopausal woman as well, because it's like that stage of a life. And I think we get to a point where all hmm. the children are our grandchildren as well, because you know that's about how we we feel communal in at that next level. And I believe that there is a secret army of grandmothers waiting to be awoken. <laughs> and yes, yeah, yes. And you know, like if we can speak the the truth without blame and shame, and go and just fucking clean everything up, you know, like. I think that nature is one of our greatest teachers, maybe, no, the greatest teacher, or maybe our children are. Our children are our greatest teachers and nature is also a greatest teacher. And there are five creatures on the planet that go through menopause and four of them live in the ocean. They're the toothed whales, pilot whales, orcas, killer whales, belusia whales, and um, narwhals, you know, the unicorn one? Yes. Now, no. this, cool. what? my mind is blown. Yeah, well, wait, no it gets idea. better. It gets I better. Love this. The, the role of, because scientists, you know, bless their cotton socks, have been trying to figure out why human females would live beyond their fertility. Like, what's the use of them? Yeah, I mean, what's the point of us, really? Exactly. <laughs> but if we look at these toothed whales, we can find out. And that is that the, they refer to them as the post-reproductive grandmothers within these 
communities of whales or pods. So her, her role is as the leader. She is the leader of the pod. And just by being there, her presence ensures that her sons and her daughters live as long as they can. And that the grandchildren, her grandchildren, their children thrive and live on. And that happens because it's her responsibility as the leader to share her wisdom, which is where all the good food is. And like, given this cycle, where do we go and what this weather, blah, blah, blah. So the post reproductive grandmother in the whale pod is the leader who is relied upon for her wisdom. So there's the clue. We need to get this army of menopausal women leading our communities and sharing their wisdom. So if we do that in the maternity care services in the world of midwifery and birth and all the offshoots, everything will be okay. We just need I to know. wake everybody up. They need to do their <laughs> inner work so that they understand why they do what they do the way they do it. So they're not reactive and that they understand what's going on and then they can speak the truth without shame or blame and be the leader that ensures that the babies will thrive. That's our job. But what so, I, what I'm that. seeing, this is from my perspective, what I'm seeing in, in the birth world is we have, a, we have made an energy People, you know, maidens who are just really angry about how things are, you know, kicking off and being angry. And then we've got this whole load of mothers who are just nurturing and, and giving and giving and giving and sacrificing in the system and being good girls to try and keep the peace. To, and then we've got morgues and they are in there and they're secretly doing their thing. But you're right, Jane, we need to we need to harness that power that I see glimpses of. And, you know, if they could step into their power within the maternity services and in midwifery, it, it would fix it. It would. We know that. Yeah. And so what we need to do is help everybody wake up from the dominant cultural perspective about how postmenopausal women are past it or invisible or what what's the reason they're alive again you know like that actually it's the next phase and it's the phase that it needs we need to rely on as leaders and wisdom keepers so that's a huge leap it is but women themselves feel that you know the the value of a woman is placed on the maiden where you're all sexy and like you know nubile and then on the mother who's raising children and then you know you hear women say become invisible one. And, you know, I've seen that, you know, you don't get looked at by men anymore and you've got grey hair, which is actually quite nice to, you know, not have pervy men perving on you. But, you know, that, mm -hmm. that you're invisible to society and like, what is your worth? And the social images of and cultural images of a po postmenopausal woman are, you know, a grumpy old crotchety old bitch. You know, the latest is Karen's. You know, I'm hearing the word, you know, people being called Karen's, and which appears to refer to any woman who speaks her mind. Um, where has this come from, Rachel? We're just like, constantly being sad. Why, why is it, what's that specific word? Why that name? Is this an Australian name or? I don't, I don't know. I don't think it's, it like, is. Probably some poor Karen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the use and the use of the word Karen seems to be shifting because I think a few years ago I heard it and I asked my daughter what it meant. And she said, oh, you know, it's one of those women who always complains in shops and says they want to speak to the manager because they're not happy with the service. <laughs> so, you know, because woman standing they've got their saying, strength. I'm not happy with what I'm getting. <laughs> no shame and no blame. So, okay. But now it just seems to be everywhere. And any woman who's kind of kicking off or speaking, speaking up is being shamed by being pointed at and said, she's a, you know, she's a Karen, get in your box be quiet you know it doesn't matter whether you agree with what the woman's saying or not the, you know she obviously is speaking her truth and then you automatically get labeled a karen you know and that just yeah, seems so to be just, the like, latest yeah it's just some ta a tactic that's the modern new or not that new tactic to keep women in their box like you know this is this is the patriarchy at work and it can it, it doesn't just mean just men do this we do it to each other. That's part of the patriarchy is the wounded sisterhood. And that's yes. actually one of the big things we need to heal too, because we've been pitted oh, God, against yes. each other. 
And, you know, like it's, a, it's an age old war tactic, divide and conquer, it works. And we've been divided and therefore conquered as a force because like, really, like if we were all tending and befriending, which is our predilection with each other and planning to do whatever is required to help the children thrive, everything would be very, very different. But we keep participating in the put down of any woman who speaks her mind or speaks out, etc. because, you know, the status quo will fall apart. And that's the role of the MAGA, to question the status quo, to shake it up and to say, actually, is this working? Ooh, it's not working. How can we work together to, to do this in another way, for example? So she's such a, yeah. the woman who speaks out is a threat. So I've got to Absolutely. put her out somehow. And, and it is this, I mean, I see it as a threat to the patriarchy. You know, if we gather together, we are a strong force. There is a huge amount within us. But it is that infighting. And that infighting is very much within the maiden culture. I feel like the mother culture is almost a lot of the time when they are tending to young children, they're not necessarily present for others or external um, because they are tending to their own family. Um, but and they're comparing become, themselves to each other in a negative way a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, in, like the mommy, the mommy wars, um, I mean, as a lactation consultant and more predominantly in that postnatal sphere, my goodness, the, the infights of how we feed our babies. And, you know, this is a, a, a huge topic that makes me incredibly sad because it, that's not what it's about. It's about building each other up and supporting each other. And we're not even doing that. And then when we as women, young in the mother phase, are then saying these, these slanderous, these sort of negative effects on women who we're actually going to become. So we're making these statements about the person we're inevitably going to be. It just, it, it's so painful to see it. And it, and it, it almost feels like it's, I think because I'm outside of that world or I'm in a different world and I'm not really in the midwifery sphere, I'm not surrounded by those women so much anymore, it can feel hopeless at times. And how do we connect those women, you know, in terms of I will have girlfriends who this is very different news for them, very new, we don't talk about it. And I have other women where I have quite a regular um, woman's circle that I hold and we will talk and we have some women in that circle who this is brand new knowledge, some women who are also on that journey and, and have deep knowing. And I feel like we need to be sharing this knowledge, but there is a resistance to it as well. And that resistance comes out in the form of using language like you're a Karen or a negative connotation. How do we get through to those women who are not in this sphere of maybe connected with the earth, connected with a type of midwifery or this way of thinking, because for me, it feels like that's the majority of women that are out there. We're a small minority who are having this conversation. Hmm. Well, I think like with everything, no, because, we have, sorry, go Rachel. No, I was just going to say, I think with the, the birth culture, it just reflects the culture of women and the culture of women is comparison and competition. And we've got into this comparison competition you know, which is whipped up through, you know, Instagram and like, you know, people curating images of themselves that are not actually themselves. Then people compare their real selves against the pretend versions of the, and it just, you know, and then we've got, you know, margas who are comparing themselves to maidens and, you know, feeling the need to then change their bodies so they look more like maidens because, you know, I'm not really worth it unless I look like this particular age. And we really need some female solidarity, which you're right, Jane, we haven't had that for you know right throughout kind of history that was that was part of when patriarchy rose up that was one of the first things they did was disrupt that solidarity because and stopped women meeting together and because it's too dangerous you know once women gather it's dangerous because we can come up that's why the gossips got you know you know Absolutely. were vilified because they were gathering and they were having conversations like this about well you know how can we do things better and i'm a bit sick of the way things are exactly 
And that's the thing, you know, if, you, if we want to understand what's going on now, we look to our history, our history. And like you just said, you know, like what we're living now is, is just a continuation of the fear that we, that, that existed not that many hundreds of years ago of just being a woman, you know? So like mm. the witch hunt and, and we were pitted against each other. We had to, we had to tell on each other or else we'd be killed. Like this is where this part of this, I mean, it goes back further than that, mm. but, but our, her story tells the story of, a lot of it, but so does the, I want to read, can I read you something? It's just a, a line out of mm -hmm. this wonderful book about bloody time, which is the, um, about bloody time, the menstrual revolution we have to have, which is a book that's a, a story about the menstrual cycle and menopause, but it's the results of the research that the Waratah project, which was a, a group of us did on menstrual cycle and menopause. And so, um, this is just one little line in here that will also add to why we think the way we think about menopause and each other. So this is um, a quote from a guest speaker at a, um, a New Zealand um, gynecological conference. It was Dr. John Studd, which I think is a very hilarious last name. <laughs> Studd. <laughs> Dr. John Studd, a consultant gynecologist at King's College Hospital in London, visiting in New London. Zealand in 1987 as a guest speaker at the gynecology conference called, he called menopause a multi-system deficiency disorder. <gasps> which affects skin, skeleton, pelvis, bladder, heart, and brain. He called menopausal women, quote, these wretched women undergoing general atrophy. Oh. So, you know, that's a gynecologist speaking. <laughs> it must be true then. <laughs> We're atrophying. Yeah. We have a disorder. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and this, this is what, eight, 1987? Yeah. So we're talking 30 years ago. Um, uh, wow. So that's just one quote, you know, like there'll be billions yeah. of them. But the story, and, and it, you know, it's, it, menopause is misunderstood. It's, it's not a hormonal deficiency and it's not a fucking disease either, you know? Like it's a natural process in a woman, a female's life. It's... It's what happens after her 40 years or so of menstruating. So that um, little saying, at Menarch, a girl meets her power. Through menstruation, she practices her power. And at menopause, she becomes her power. Mm. Those wretched women going through general atrophy. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, God, that's losing everything. That's our a minds, way to pull this down, you know, like. Because they and saw the, the strength. I mean, how else do yeah. you pull someone down? If you see that strength and you're frightened about them over, you know, overbearing you, overcoming, that how will, how would the patriarchy put women down if they suddenly got together, rose up with this incredible power and also were leaders to bring the stronger women. So in terms of, physical strength the mothers the maidens and then they are leading the pack that's you know that's scary that's frightening how do we push those people down and we've seen it in history and they've done it over and over again so well and we are now as you say both of you we are infighting and we've got these sort of civil wars within women and the structures then crumble mm. and we need to bring us back together so that we, and we have this strength and we remember, you know, our red thread, you know, we know now genetically, you know, you remember memories are genetically passed on. So we have these memories deep in ourselves of that persecution for speaking out and for you know, the, the main target of the witch hunts were women who were margers, particularly women who were margers who did not depend on men because then they could take their land. So, you know, they, they persecute. So she's a witch. 
like let's persecute her now we can take her land off her because you know she hasn't got a man so she was actually existing without a man that's really dangerous and there was a real concern about women in that era who were you know i can't remember the they actually used a phrase for the women who were not tethered to men were you know considered really quite dangerous because they had power in their own right and we remember that you know, that's that's still with us, which is why, as you were saying, you know, how do we get over that fear? Because it's almost like, uh, you know, when you speak out, it just arises that kind of real fear of, oh, my, oh. They'll see me, they'll notice me, they'll hear me. This, It's all over. This is too scary. And just want to say something as well, that I, I don't think that the, that the people who are, I don't think that the patriarchy is thinking, oh, we need to control postmenopausal women, they're too powerful. I think what's actually going on is mm. the women go through perimenopause and everything feels different and it's, it's discombobulating and a bit scary and you don't feel the same way you did before and you don't do the same things and people say, you know, like, what's wrong with you? You're not happy anymore. You, you're not, you don't, you know, you don't do the same things. You don't talk to me in the same, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that's because this veil of the hormone of accommodation is lifting. So everything changes, but in, in, a, when you don't know that's what's happening, it's terrifying and your relationships are suffering. Your body's, doing things that you don't, you know, you have insomnia and you have, have hot flushes and all of that. Until you get what that's about, it just looks like a disease. But if we understand it's a labor and a birth, then everything makes sense, including not drugging mm. yourself through it. You know, like midwife, mm. like mm. saying, like the, the modern thing, and I had a conversation with a, a woman recently who's writing a menopausal book, you know her, Rachel, and she's, she's been um, um, contracted to write it and it's a mainstream book. So she has to, you know, say certain things and not say other certain things. And what she's seen in her research is that HRT, hormone replacement therapy is the, is the thing, you know? So it's the thing that everybody gets offered or uh, is encouraged to go on. That's because then it's business as usual and you don't feel upset anymore or cranky or dis discombobulated because it, you don't have to change. You can just stay in this limbo zone, drugged, like, which is similar to being on the pill, you know, it's like somewhere between here and there, a little bit numb and a little bit like, can't really figure out why you don't feel right because it's not right. But the thing about um, HRT, it's not the go-to for, um, menopause it it needs to be the last resort for people who need medical help medical intervention in the same way as we do around birth you know like promoting hrt mm -hmm. for women post menopause or during perimenopause is like saying oh yeah an induction of labor and an epidural plus or minus a cesarean that's okay no it's fine and we know it's not fine we know the ramifications of that so same same you know if you drug yep. yourself through menopause, you miss out on menopause's version of what we know natural birth does. Mm -hmm. Same, yep. same. It unravels you. That's what childbirth does. Childbirth unravels you, doesn't it? And so yep. does perimenopause, so that you yep. kind of put yourself back together at the, in the end as something different to how you kind of exactly. went into it. There's a lovely other piece here too, that in traditional Chinese medicine, menopause is referred to as our second spring. Oh, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> and if you actually That's really nice think race. about what that means, it's the next growth. It's like, you know, at spring seeds sprout and the seeds that sprout at spring are from the harvest from the cycle before right? So yep. in our second spring, we're, we're sprouting seeds from our own harvest, you know, what the growth we've gone through, and then it's the rebirth. So, you know, and also menopause is a cultural experience in, in, in cultures that value age and wise women, the women don't have dreadful journeys through menopause, unless there's pathology in their own story or whatever, but, you know, so 
the and and there's less and less of those cultures as well because the western way is permeating everything and that's the basic thing you know the patriarchy is fixated on youth and beauty and achievement and um you can, it's none of that is sustainable and we're seeing the story of our culture's attitude to menopause uh, which is basically the descent you know like the the um, autumn season, so I didn't finish saying the seasons and the rites of passage, but Marga is the autumn season. So that's the harvest. And that's, that's where you get to see how successful or not your gardening techniques were in the growth season that preceded it. So, and then we have our winter, which is our crone. So crone, which is a word that a lot of people can't handle feel it's very much a put down, but it actually means crown. And so crone is the wise, the crowned wise woman. And that season in our life, that winter season is from about like 70 or so till we die. And so a lot of women won't know about Marga, but we'll know about maiden mother and crone. But that's, that's an old story when women used to die closer to menopause than we do now. Now it's like halfway, you know, we've got the second half of our life. And the other thing that really impacts our attitudes to menopause is that our lives as women are compared to the lives of men. So the male experience is seen as the normal and the female is the abnormal. So men don't understand. It's a bit like what we just have seen um, in this pandemic here in Australia with the uh, latest ridiculous recommendation from the um, obstetricians and gynecologists of Australia and New Zealand oh. banning the use of water mm -hmm. in showers and baths in labour. Yeah. Like, what? what? But you know what, Jane, you know what, you know what the, the background to that is? I mean, we, we've done a podcast on the, you know, how obstetricians, how medicine took over nursing and midwifery blah 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 but so so the college of midwives signed a memorandum of understanding with the college of obstetricians like how can how can anyone think doing that is it not about power so i think the the obstetricians then took that to mean that we're friends now and we can legitimately make statements on behalf of midwives so then they come out with this ridiculous statement saying to protect midwives and obstetricians you know women can't birth in water and it's interesting because the midwifery college has kicked up and gone that's not evidence-based that's bullshit and then the obstetricians have gone oh i can't believe you're being so mean to us when you signed a memorandum of understanding it's like it's just history repeating itself and you know as you know you know it's obvious that banning water birth has been done based on people who don't attend water birth because it's not evidence-based, it's not woman-centered, and it makes no sense. They obviously think that women are splashing about like toddlers, throwing dirty woman water everywhere <laughs> into people's faces. It's just, it's hilarious. If it wasn't so awful that this is actually being taken as a, an official statement that's being put into practice. Mm. Yeah. As well as showers though, banning showers. Yes. Oh. Yeah, and is like, this is this now current practice, or is the ACM yeah. obviously being outside of Australia? I'm I'm a little behind on this in terms of there's different practices going on around the world. Is this currently being rebutted, or that's not it's the in the process? It? I mean, there are reg there are rules now in certain hospitals in Victoria that women can't go in the shower in labour. So they've brought those rules in, and they are being abided by currently until until there is until it's refuted, I give thanks the for the marga midwives standing yep. up in their labor wards and their birth centers and their programs and saying what the fuck are you saying this is not okay with their knowledge yeah yeah so this is a perfect time perfect example perfect opportunity for our marga army our menopausal midwife army to say sorry <laughs> sorry people this has gone on for too long in the wrong direction. We need to do a course correction now. And, and look, the other thing about what's going on now with the pandemic and all the restrictions is it's actually showing us 
how we're not ready for this. We're not ready. Our maternity care services system is not ready for a crisis. Mm. And we can be using this as an opportunity to get ready. And it's pretty obvious what needs to happen. Low risk births need to happen out of hospital and that system needs to be working for everybody. Yep, just like the research and evidence shows us. Yes. <laughs> low risk healthy women do better away from medical settings and we need access to medical settings for women who need it or want it. But that shouldn't be the routine. You know, like you were saying with menopause, some women will need medical support. Most won't, it shouldn't be a routine. Mm. Absolutely. So that's it, you know, it's like, Honoring the woman on her journey, not having like a, uh, this is the way we do it. So we know that from birth and that's what needs to apply to menopause in that it's not just take the drugs so that everybody else finds you easier to be with. It's let us support you through your unraveling because it is an unraveling and it has to be, it has to be an unraveling, you know, like, so much has gone on in all of our lives to this moment that we actually need to do some like real analysis like you would at autumn, right? You look at what you've got and you think, oh, fuck, I should have watered that plant more or <laughs> I, I should have given some nourishment to the soil or I should have, you know, whatever, just thinking metaphoric gardening techniques. And so there at <laughs> menopause, it can get messy, but just like childbirth is messy or just like a menstrual cycle is messy, women are messy. <laughs> and that's not bad, you know? Messy just means not containable or perhaps wild, you know? Like what we're mm -hmm. dealing with is tamed women. And I'm sorry if that's offensive, but we have been tamed and domesticated and we need to return to our wildness. And there's lots of ways we can do that. And one of them is to honor the menstrual cycle and honor birth and honor menopause and lean into them for the magical opportunities they provide for us to become what's required of us if we were whales, to be the leaders of our communities, <laughs> sharing our wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And one of the things that fuels all that in the postmenopausal woman is her testosterone level. So that doesn't go down like estrogen and progesterone does at the same rate or at the same time. So relatively speaking, we have a higher testosterone level than we've ever had before. And so that's what brings us out and brings us, gives us purpose and mission and, and all of that. So, you know, that's not a nice girl. No, that's the naughty girl showing herself or out of the box. <laughs> but it, I feel like we should embrace that. It's, it's a messy journey, but it's hopefully we, you know, those hormone st structure changes have been in that way to give us the strength, the knowing, the self-belief, the fuck it all, I don't care kind of attitude so that we can actually cope with the messiness and the unraveling. It, it, when you put it like that, it kind of makes sense. It is a journey. It's a lot longer than labor, but it's, it's bloody hard work. But there's certain changes in your body that are allowing you to say, do you know what? I can cope with this now. I don't have to think about others. It's, this is about me mm -hmm. and it's about my unraveling. It's about my journey. It's about my learnings and my reflections so that I can make it to this next point where I have taken everything I've known. And now I am this queen. I'm this strong woman. I'm this grandma with knowledge of whatever comes with that. But also it's given you the time and possibly the hormone structure to be able to say, do you know what? I'm ready to face those stories. I'm ready to face that heritage and that red thread that perhaps I wasn't strong enough to look at before because this hurt too much. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly it. And also part of the unraveling can be a lot of grief because yeah. once you get postmenopausal, there's things that will never happen again. And yeah. there are changes to your body that change how you do things or can do things or want to do things or whatever so that it affects all your relationships 
So there's some grieving to do as well in, with the change, but there's some fucking amazing stuff as well. And three things I can just think of off the top of my head. And so follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, both that we know are all about ovulation. So they um, do this and this through the cycle. And then postmenopausally, they go up to the same levels that they are when we ovulate, when we're like, you know. Yes. yes. And stay there. Ugh. Okay, that's definitely, and, definitely worth so, going through it if you get yeah, to yeah. that and at the end. Dr. Christian Northrup, who has a lot to say about this, and I really encourage anybody thinking about menopause to read her book called The Wisdom of Menopause. She says that that's responsible for what women experience post-menopause, which is increased intuition and increased visionary capacity. So, you know... I'm experiencing that big time. Rachel, I imagine you are beginning to do that. You, yeah. Mm. yeah. And the other it's that thing... It's, it's the Sorry. ovulation without the... It's the ovulation without the estrogen, isn't it? It's that kind of real kind of energy, but without it being focused outward, mm. kind of more focused in. Yeah. Yeah. And switched on, you know, like... Mm. Um, it's, it's incredible. The other thing that changes is orgasm. So there's all this terrible story about, you know, thinned vaginal walls and... <laughs> yes, not enough that. lubrication, yeah. sex Which is, is going to get worse. It's yes. true. So you have to do a whole new re renegotiation around your body and, and um, sex and your libido and all of that. But the thing is, orgasms are much stronger and longer. And and is that because we are more relaxed in ourselves and we've learned about our bodies? I or think is it's that... because of the testosterone. Shit, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> now, you see, that's a secret that's not told to women. Women are not told that. We're told that once we get to menopause, because, you know, we no longer look like we did as maidens, that that's yeah. it as far as sex is concerned. It all shrivels up, falls out, or gets taken out. And, yeah. And there's no hope. Yeah, you're, you're over and done with. You're <laughs> yeah. on the, the, the shit path. From the, compared to how you were. Because the yes. dance is not, fuck me, I want to conceive. It's not that anymore. <laughs> it's fuck me, I want to enjoy this and let's make it last long. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or something else, maybe. <laughs> but the other thing, the other really important thing, which I mustn't forget to tell you about hot flushes, which is 80% of women have hot flushes and apparently 40% uh, continue to have them after 60 years old too. I'm in that. I'm still having hot flushes, but the You're thing kidding. about, hot... no, it's okay. It's okay. Okay, but good. They are, <laughs> they are alchemy happening. Let use them to burn away what you need to burn away. But the thing that happens with a hot flush is that it has an aura you know, like, a, like an epileptic fit has an aura or a migraine has an aura. So, you know how people know, yeah. oh, something's, I know so it's going to happen. So yeah. this is virtually unknown amongst women having hot flushes that hot flushes have an aura. And what it is, is it's a hit of adrenaline. And so the experience that a woman has before a hot flush comes on is a feeling of doom or dread or, oh shit, something's wrong or oh, is something's wrong with me or like adrenaline? So a fight or flight kind of thing. And mm -hmm. then the hot flush comes. So the problem is that people aren't matching them together, which they are, they're the part of the same thing. And so women think they're getting anxiety and then they get put on another drug for anxiety. And then, you know, but the Adrenaline hit before a hot flush is part of a hot flush, not a sign that you're losing it and getting anxiety. That's wonderful mm -hmm. to hear. Tell everybody that it's so important because that's so many diagnoses, anxiety, depression, blah, blah, blah. When it's just the process. Yep. That's and that's one of that's the biggest know. symptom I've had just anxiety, not directed at anything in particular that can 
pick up, but just general, generalized anxiety that I'll sometimes will reach this peak. And I spend my time going, what is this about? Because I'm not actually anxious about anything, but I've just got this physical kind of, it's almost like behind my face anxiety mm. happening. But it's obviously part of part of the process. Yeah. It's not about anything in particular. Yeah. Well, just watch if that mm. peaks before you have a hot flush and see if that's just something that you maintain mm. with a thought process. I will do. You know, we can scare ourselves pretty well. We're good at that. <laughs> yes, there's something wrong. Oh my God, it's actually going to get worse. It is getting worse. <laughs> and now I'm sweating. It's really bad. The anger is terrible. <laughs> and insomnia, you know, like everybody's like, oh, I can't function with insomnia. Well, don't get up, you know, like, so if we're reaching a whole new version of ourselves, maybe we have to get information in the middle of the night. I was just going to ask you, when you said get up, I wondered whether that was a time when, if you've ever done that, or you know of people who've got up and then they've got these, these visions, these, this intuition, this creativity, this ability to write, or they see things, they think things, is this the time? Because that's when you said it, I was thinking, no, make the most of that. Because that's obviously, mm. there's a reason why we're in the middle of the night, because things feel different in the middle of the night, we think differently it's quiet, we're more in tune with ourselves, with the outside world. Exactly. Maybe this is a time. I think so. Well, I've but, just started you know, doing that, Jane, because I, 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 I used to lie there and just get annoyed with myself because I'm like now not sleeping properly. I'm going to be tired tomorrow and rah, 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 round and round. And if I can't go back to sleep, I get up and I actually, you know, write things, have ideas that I write down and then I go back to sleep and they're there in the morning and I go oh Fantastic. that was quite clever yeah. how did you think of that so clever <laughs> yeah so like you know it's the same as um just thinking with the main audience being midwives or doulas birth workers that like you know if we we, we have to trust the process we're not broken. I mean, we do bring to menopause everything we need to heal in ourselves. So we'll go through experiences that we need to go to, to bring things to the surface, just like you were saying, Katie, because we're ready to now. And yeah. so, you know, there'll be things that come up, but they have to. Can't go and be sad old ladies, you know? We want to be happy old ladies. So we need to use menopause as the healing process that it is, so we can, as Dr. Christian Northrup says, heal all the unhealed parts of us. And she says, everything that we swept under the carpet comes out at menopause. So, you know, it has to. Otherwise we end up bitter and twisted old ladies rather than what we're supposed to be, which is leaders of our communities being relied upon for our wisdom. And I think- And that having lots of orgasms. And having lots of orgasms. As you wish, no pressure with that. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's the next frontier, you know, like menstruation is being reclaimed and there's period parties now and they even use red liquid in pad ads, you know, they're being yeah. true. We're actually not blue no. anymore. No. Oh, no. we've moved on. We no. don't bleed blue. <laughs> hey, I don't bleed like the woman on TV. What's wrong with me, mum? <laughs> exactly. And then birth, you know, like birth is, birth is being reclaimed better in some places than others. And, but menopause is, uh, well, I, you know, I don't want to exclude death, but menopause is one of the last frontiers for us to, to reclaim. And according to Jane Fonda, in a, in a podcast that I listened to, she said that menopausal women were the, the largest demographic in the Western world. So there is a grandmother army out there that I'm waiting to see rise up. I think that's a good place to listen to, to this podcast. They will. <laughs> and before you go, Jane, can you just tell, cause I'm sure people are listening to this going, I want more. Can you tell people where they can find you and what you're offering at the moment? Sure. Um, so I've got a website, janehardwickcollings.com, and I've lots of things on there that I've written and an online shop for the books that I've written. And I'm just about, like, in the next couple of weeks, about to launch an e-course 
called Autumn Woman Harvest Queen, which is about harnessing the transformational power of menopause. And it's like an education, catch up, relearn, and then a process that you go through and some shamanic journeys and some crafting and all that. So that's going to be available in the next little while. And then there's the School of Shamanic Womancraft website as well that's got the workshops and programs like what Rachel did on it. So, And we put yeah. all those links into the show notes so people can find them. I've recently just about, I've launched it to my newsletter subscribers, but I'll do it to everybody else next week. Another little e-course, it's not little, another e-course, which is called Snake Medicine, Shedding Menstrual Shame. Mm. so that's something to do in the <laughs> comfort of your own home so some, some e-courses coming out as well as workshops and the books and excellent all that kind of stuff. that's great for us on the other side of the world thank you jane mm -hmm. and especially now mm -hmm. fantastic it's been an absolute treasure and a pleasure to have you on and i could talk to you all day long and mm -hmm. um i look forward to the e-courses and it's just been remarkable i've learned so much i felt so much i feel like i've been through a wave of emotions just sitting and listening to you mm -hmm. so i really want to thank you for your time uh genuinely mean that thank you thank you katie thank you very much and thank you rachel love working thank with you, you. <laughs> To be good. Yes, let's do something again. Yeah. <laughs> As always, I want to thank you all for listening to today's episode and ask you to share widely with your friends and colleagues and anyone else you think could do with a bit of the Midwives Cauldron podcast in their ears. Like us, subscribe and leave us a comment and we will see you on the next episode. Bye.